Hey, podcast friends. Professor Anthony Sweat from the Department of Church History and Doctrine here. In the spring of 1820, a young boy named Joseph Smith went to a grove of trees to pray. You and I know this story like the back of our hand. I mean, this story has become foundational and essential to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In fact, the first vision of Joseph Smith has become so essential that the April 2020 General Conference was designated by President Russell M. Nelson as a bicentennial year to celebrate the first vision. In the springtime of the year 2020, it will be exactly 200 years since Joseph Smith experienced the theophany that we know as the first vision. God the Father and His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, appeared to Joseph, a 14-year-old youth. That event marked the onset of the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ in its fullness. But something you may not know is this. If you and I were members of the church in the 1830s or 1840s or 1850s, it's highly likely that we wouldn't know about Joseph Smith's first vision. Listen to what Stephen Harper said about this. The first vision didn't necessarily have to become the founding story of the church. It it went for 50 years where uh, the early saints did not think of the first vision as sort of the founding of their faith, and um, it was not taught by the missionaries widely. So what happened? How did the first vision become the first story that we tell in the narrative of the Restoration? Well, BYU Church History and Doctrine Professor Stephen Harper has dedicated most of his professional life to understanding how the first vision became remembered and recorded and understood by Joseph Smith and the church. He has recently published a seminal book, and you guys, I mean seminal, by Oxford University Press. And yes, I'll say that again, Oxford. The book is called First Vision, Memory and Mormon Origins. On today's episode, I hope you're excited to hear Stephen Harper share his insights into how the first vision became remembered and understood by Joseph Smith and by us today, and why the first vision is so important. This is Why Religion. Each year, religion professors at Brigham Young University produce hundreds of publications on subjects related to The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. This podcast brings this research into one place to enlighten the everyday seeker of truth. Seek learning, even by study and also by faith. Interviewing the author, we discuss why the study was done, why it matters, and why the professor chooses to be both a scholar and a disciple. This is Why Religion, research to enlighten your mind. Professor Brad Wilcox from the Department of Ancient Scripture here at BYU recently sat down with Stephen Harper from the Department of Church History and Doctrine to talk about his book, First Vision, Memory and Mormon Origins. There are so many gems in this conversation to enlighten your understanding about the First Vision. So without any more delay, here's Professor Wilcox and Professor Harper. Now this book that you've produced on the First Vision— Uh, has just fascinated me because I have heard other people describe the different First Vision accounts, and they usually focus primarily on similarities or differences or different audiences. But I love that you've done something fresh and new because you're looking not just at the differences between the the versions that Joseph Smith provided, but also the context— in which he was living when he provided those various accounts. And that is just fascinating. Tell us a little bit about how you decided to go that direction. <laughs> Great question. For me, it has it's an intersection of a profound personal experience and then training as a historian. So, you know, as a historian, you're trained in memories. All you have to work with are people's memories in some way or other. And so you have to become a, a skillful evaluator of memories. But having said that, um, historians generally haven't been particularly great at that. We ought to be. We ought to be more concerned about and invested in understanding how people remember than 
and just about anything else. Well, and I think a lot of historians say, well, if it was written after the time it happened, then we can't trust it. Right. But you say, yes, we can. Yeah, you know, it, it, it has to be evaluated carefully. But the the idea that that a memory is, decays at a predictable rate over time, that's not sound. It's a commonly held assumption, but it's not a sound idea. There are all kinds of complicating factors for why a memory at the time might not be reliable and a memory long after the an event might be very reliable. So it's much more complex and we sometimes reduce it. But I was in uh, Nauvoo with my wife on a semester travel study in the early 90s when I Uh, got encephalitis, this infection in the tissues around my brain. And I spent about two weeks in the University of Iowa hospital not knowing who I was or where I was. And um, that fascinating and very, very frustrating experience of losing my memory has shaped really just about everything I've thought about ever since. And so I'm very interested in how Joseph Smith remembered the first vision. Uh, one one um, hostile biographer of Joseph is, says in the opening of his biography, he says, how can we be sure that Joseph related the event as he experienced it at the time? It's a good question. Uh, it's a kind of prejudiced question. I'm not sure the investigator here is really interested in answering it as much as planting doubt in Joseph's memories. But I've become convinced that an even better question that we can answer because of the richness of the accounts of the vision is not only how Joseph experienced the vision at the time, we can get at that in part. We're never going to get at it completely because it defied all description. We don't have everything Joseph experienced. But even better, because we have accounts from 1832 and 35 and 38 and 42, we can ex- see how Joseph experienced the vision not only at the time, but over time. And that's big. That's a big deal. And that's a perfectly legitimate thing to do. Again, everybody does. Even the critics of Joseph Smith who fault him for doing it do this with their own lives. And um, I am grateful to have this understanding of the vision accounts because there are things in them that Joseph could tell us the meaning of only a- after much experience. The simplest way to see that is that we call it the first vision. Well, you don't call it the first vision on the day it happens or the day after. You only call it the first vision after you've had a subsequent vision. And it may be striking to people to even imagine that the first vision didn't necessarily have to become the founding story of the church. It it went for 50 years where uh, the early saints did not think of the first vision as sort of the founding of their faith, and um, it was not taught by the missionaries widely. It's an interesting thing to think of the contingencies, the choices that had to be made for the first vision to become a, a major part of our understanding. First of all, Joseph had to record a memory of it, and that was by no means a foregone conclusion because he was rejected to the first person he by the first person he told. It was the a minister. minister. Right. And he said after that he could find no one who would believe. I think the rejection made him very reticent to trot that out and cast those pearls before before swine, or, or at least in a way that's going to get him hurt. So think about it. You know, it's 12 years later, two and a half years after the church has been organized, the Lord has commanded him on the day the church is organized to let a record be kept, and in it you should be called a prophet, apostle, translator, etc. A um, couple of years later, Joseph still hasn't begun keeping his own history, and uh, the Lord reminds him to in very direct terms. So by now, he's got the original and the printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon. He's got dozens of his own Revelation manuscripts, but there's no record of his first revelation. Joseph thinks of himself as a revelator and a translator. He's, he's happy to produce texts that the Lord gives him. But when the Lord says, you've got to produce your own narrative of your own experience, he's very reticent to do that. And when he starts to do it, he he 
um, you can tell he's hesitant. It's rough. It's a very rough literary product. And he says, look, I only barely got a chance to, to go to school to learn reading, writing, and the ground rules of arithmetic. You're going to have to excuse this. And this comes rel- very shortly after he writes Emma a letter. And it's a rough piece of writing. And he says, oh, Emma, forgive me of my, my inadequacies here. And then right after this earliest account of the first vision that he gives us in 1832, there's a letter in the same book, and he, cro- he, he prays spontaneously in this letter, Lord, deliver me from the narrow prison of paper, pen, and ink, and a crooked, broken, scattered, imperfect language. And then he crosses those lines out as if he's unsatisfied with them. And yet anybody who's written, anybody who has done this, I mean, you probably felt it even as you were writing this book. It's, a, it's something that we struggle with, uh, and surely he struggled with it in even a greater degree because of his lack of formal education. I think so. It's one of I, I see Joseph as having two pretty profound dilemmas that he has to wrestle with regarding the first vision. And the first one is definitely the command to record it and his sense of inadequacy in doing so. He just doesn't feel up to that task. He knows it's important. But thank heavens that he does. He does record it, and he gains confidence in doing so. I don't think he likes that earliest version, although I love it. Um, it's very raw. So beautiful, right? It is very, raw. Very honest. I become convicted of my sins, yes. right, uh, in the context of the revival preaching. And the problem is he doesn't know where to turn for forgiveness of sins because as he observes the churches— he doesn't see any that match the New Testament model, and this becomes a grief to my soul. And he finally has to go to the woods, to the Lord in, in the wilderness, as he says, and pour out his heart there. And he says, The Lord opened the heavens upon me, and I saw the Lord. And he said unto me, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. And I know, I know that you're worried about, as I am, anxious teenagers who are worried about their sins and wanting to know if God is forgiving. And this, of, of all the beautiful things in the restored gospel, this account of Joseph's vision is a testimony that God is loving and forgiving and that Christ is our and Savior. this was not a view of God that was common because a common view of God at the time would have been that he's mean and that he's, he's uh, not going, that he's harsh and judgmental. This gets right to the heart of Joseph's second dilemma. And that is, is God the God of the Presbyterians at Joseph's time or of the Methodists, right? You know that he says, I was somewhat inclined to Methodism. I had a desire to be united with the Methodists. And then in his uh, manuscript history account, the one excerpted in the Pearl of Great Price, there's the line where he says, I told my mom after the vision, I've learned for myself Presbyterian isn't true. Joseph's not trying to be mean to Presbyterians. What he's telling us is, that he's very concerned about the different conceptions of God in those two traditions. And at Joseph's time and place, Presbyterians are still very much um, informed by the doctrines of the French theologian of the Protestant Reformation, John Calvin. Calvin has a harsh view of God and of humanity, totally depraved. All of us are totally depraved sinners as a result of the fall. The most famous Presbyterian sermon in American history from 1741, the great Reverend Jonathan Edwards says, and this is a sermon on mercy of all things, and to convince um, the people that he's talking to about how merciful God is, his point is to them, you deserve to be in hell right now. Natural men are held in the hand of God over the pit of hell. They have deserved the fiery pit and are already sentenced to it. And the very fact that you're not there is evidence that God's merciful. And so in this sermon, uh, uh, remember this line, it's just searing, where the Reverend Edwards says, God abhors you. So if you're Joseph Smith and you're a teenager in the evangelical culture that he comes of age in, he says from about 12 to 15, my mind becomes seriously impressed with regard to the all-important concerns for the welfare of my immortal soul because he is being told, God abhors you and you deserve to be damned. 
and his own sinfulness, as he's becoming painfully aware of, is his evidence that they're right, or he worries that they might be right. The alternative is Methodism. The Methodists are also saying, you are fallen, but they're saying that the atonement of Christ is accessible on certain conditions. Joseph, you can choose to come to Christ. You can choose to partake of his atonement, and you can feel his love and be born again. That sounds good to Joseph, and he tells some friends just about a month before he dies, he tells them that he went to the Methodist meetings and that he wanted very badly to feel and shout like the rest. He wants to feel God's love and power and shout for joy like other Methodist converts, but he says, I could feel nothing. So his heart tells him Methodism is the way. His lack of ability to get a conversion experience says maybe his head is right and his sins um, are evidence that he, he's that Presbyterians are right and there's nothing he can do about affecting his salvation through Christ. So this is the wrestle. This is the dilemma he has. And the only way to resolve it is to go to God directly in the woods, which he does with great success. Now, you mentioned that Orson Pratt is the figure in history who kind of kept the vision at people's forefront. But you also mentioned in the book that B.H. Roberts is the one who elaborated the theology of it. What do you mean by that? Well, notice that Joseph just tells the story, right? And the takeaway for Joseph is, I had learned for myself that I could ask and receive and not be upbraided. So... Joseph leaves it at that, and now, you know, just about any um, seminary student can kind of rattle off a list of things that the first vision teaches us. Yeah, that there is a God, that God knows us by name, that God and Jesus are separate beings. Right, right. These things, and those are theological uh, things that are in the first vision, right? The seeds of all of these teachings are there in the first vision. Even though Joseph doesn't elaborate on them himself, he just tells the story. So it's up to people like B.H. Roberts to come along later and see in Joseph's accounts of the vision, notice these lessons that we can learn. Sometimes that's good, um, but we can overdo that too. Uh, B.H. Roberts was in a, a theological debate with a Catholic priest early in the 20th century, And they went back and forth uh, on the nature of God, and um, Elder Roberts used the first vision as a way to illustrate some important points about the nature of God. But I fear that sometimes we miss some of the most important lessons of the first vision by overemphasizing some that are important but not all important. For example, think about what we just talked about. Is it most important that God and Christ are separate and embodied or that they're full of love. I don't mean to make it an either or, it's not an either or, but so what if God and Christ are distinct from each other and embodied if they're not also full of love for us, redeeming love? And willing to forgive. Indeed. If if Reverend Edwards was right that God abhors you, then it doesn't matter much if God and Christ are separate from each other. But if if they are full of love for us, right? It's not that they're just without body parts or uh, body or parts. It's that they are thought to sometimes be without passions, without love for us. And that's what Joseph Smith found and emphasized. It was the love that he felt from them in answer, condescending to answer him and relieve him of the anxiety and fear, uh, guilt that he felt. That's the takeaway lesson from the Grove that, that first day. If you're interested in more high-quality, peer-reviewed gospel scholarship like this research that Stephen Harper has done, I would draw your attention to a really cool journal called The Religious Educator, published here at Brigham Young University. The Religious Educator is an academic journal whose goal is to provide carefully reviewed, inspirational, informative articles that benefit a broad range of Latter-day Saint audiences who love the gospel and its teachings. This journal's been around for 20 years. And listen to how cool this is. 
all the issues that are over a year old, so 19 years worth of issues, are available for you for free online for your use. If you go to rsc.byu.edu and click on the Religious Educator link, you'll find the past 20 years of excellent articles and also a link on how to subscribe to this journal if you're interested. That's rsc.byu.edu. We've been listening to Professor Brad Wilcox interview Professor Stephen Harper on his 2019 Oxford book publication, First Vision, Memory and Mormon Origins. We've arrived at part two of Why Religion on this episode, and in this part we like to get into the application side of things. How does this publication help us to learn, live, and apply the gospel? Why does this research really matter in the lives of an everyday saint like you or me? So here again is Professor Brad Wilcox and Professor Stephen Harper talking about some of these why questions. You quote Richard Bushman as saying, we now benefit from having not just one, but many accounts of the first vision. And you can see that Richard Bushman is saying, this is a plus. And we see that in the New Testament. I mean, there are four accounts of Christ's life given by the different gospel writers. And we have never looked at that as being a drawback. And yet suddenly everyone thinks that multiple versions is a negative. Why is that? Well, it has a lot to do with um, who gets to interpret the facts, Right? The facts of the matter are we have four primary accounts of Joseph Smith's first vision. And what? Five other? Five secondary ones. Secondary accounts. Yeah. Meaning four that come from him or his scribes under his direction during his lifetime, and five that come from contemporaries of his, people who heard him tell it and who wrote it during his lifetime. Now, those facts are completely neutral. They don't prove or disprove that his testimony is true. They don't, they don't have any emotion on them or in them. It's what a person decides those facts mean that makes all the difference. And because there's so much at stake in the first vision, lots of people have a vested interest in interpreting the facts in their favored way. So that can be done with sinister intent, right? Did you know there are four accounts of the vision? Joseph can't tell the truth. He can't keep his story straight. Joseph must be a liar. He must not be reliable. Those are all interpretations of facts that may or may not be true, but they're not, they're not, they have to be verified and proven. They, they don't just come by default with the facts. And of course, my way of interpreting the facts is also, um, I I'm, I'm have a very vested interest in it. Did you know there are four accounts of the first vision? Isn't that the greatest thing you've ever heard, <laughs> right? Isn't it wonderful to have such a richly, richly documented vision of this greatest event since the resurrection of the Savior? And uh, that's the interpretation of the facts that I want to promote and uh, invite people to consider. And so it's really important that we are aware not only of what the facts are, but of what interpreters we're privileging in our lives. And I, I think that people should be aware of all the possible interpretations of the facts. You should consider all of them. And uh, so it's not that the, you don't are you not forced to a default interpretation of the facts of the first vision. It troubles me that some people are willing to let other people interpret the facts for them. That's not that's not studying by you know with our whole heart and mind and strength and seeking learning by study and by faith. The, gospel, the, the accounts of the First Vision have never been more accessible. They're in the Gospel Library app. They're all over the place online. So they're, they're increasingly well known, but it's also the case that for a good chunk of the 20th century, they were not well known. And uh, when people did want to know about them, they were often told, no, nothing, nothing here for you to see. And you know, I'm a historian, so I, I sort of feel like I have this right to read everybody's journals and diaries and emails and so forth. <laughs> Come on over, Steve. Mine are down in the basement. Great. <laughs> Great. But I know that um, there's a time where it's understandable that 
the leaders of the church, are not real eager to throw the gates open to all of the historical records. And that has a lot to do with the way the church is treated throughout the 19th century. So I sometimes get at this by reminding people about how how little time and distance there is between Joseph Smith and Joseph Fielding Smith, his, his the you know the the son of Joseph F, who's the son of Hiram. So if you imagine if you're Joseph F. Smith, you're just a little boy, and the last memory you have of your father is seeing a big bullet hole in the side of his face and smelling his decaying body, and you know very well that nobody ever holds his murderers accountable. And you know that those people have driven you and your people across and outside the country. And uh, you have found a home in the Rocky Mountains and you feel pretty upset your whole life. And your son, Joseph Fielding Smith, inherits that. He remembers when they dragged you, Joseph F. Smith, in front of the Senate and grilled you about whether you really are a prophet and really receive revelations. And tried literally, you know, to force the church to, into submission. So if you are Joseph F. Smith and Joseph Fielding Smith, you, you grow up with an understandably defensive posture. And you don't want to have a sign on, put a sign on yourself saying, kick me again. Right, exactly right. So Joseph F., Joseph Fielding Smith rather becomes an apostle. He becomes the church historian. He inherits his father's records. He literally keeps them in his office, in a safe that he gets from his father. And he thinks of himself as the guardian, the protector. And it's understandable when people write to him and say, can I see Alexander Niebuhr's journal entry, or can I see the 1832 account of the vision? He says, no, no, I'll tell you about what it says, but I'm not going to allow that stuff out. So, you know, today I sort of feel like, uh, you know, I, I feel like I have a right to all those things, but I understand very well, uh, and I can be empathetic to the idea that at, uh, at that time, in the middle of the 20th century, it did not seem like a good idea to let the sacred historical records out to anybody who might want to use them for any reason, including as a weapon. Now, since the dawn of the information age, that's just untenable. And the leaders of the church have opened the doors. And the Joseph Smith Papers website is the best evidence of that. It's unbelievably open access to all the first vision accounts in rich detail. And yet so many still are unwilling to even go there or read. Instead, they're just settling for little sound bites that show up yeah. on on the internet or in anti-Mormon literature, and they're unwilling to go and see for themselves. That's what puzzles me about some responses. I can't imagine being willing to let someone else tell me what the First Vision accounts say. I have to see them for myself. I mean, that, that these documents exist that testify that Joseph Smith saw the Father and the Son in New York, in the Grove, I, there's no way you could keep me from reading those documents myself and devouring them and reading them over and over again. And it mystifies me why anybody, why there's anybody who doesn't feel that same way. I can't understand that. If you're interested in hearing more of Professor Harper's thoughts on how the first vision went from a lesser known personal event in Joseph Smith's life to a foundational narrative of the church, I'd highly recommend you read his book, First Vision, Memory and Mormon Origins, published by Oxford University Press. It really is a landmark book. If you go to rsc.byu.edu forward slash why religion, I've included a link to Professor Harper's book. I've also included a few links to some other articles he's written and published on how the First Vision was remembered and recorded. Again, that's rsc.byu.edu forward slash why religion. We've arrived at part three of our episode. And for this last part of why religion, we like to talk with the professor about their professional and personal journey that led them to where they are at. Why did they choose to become a religious educator? Why did they choose to be an academic? And above all, why did they choose to believe 
and why do they choose faith in the restored gospel of Jesus Christ? So to wrap up this episode, here's Professor Harper sharing some of his personal insights on these questions. Would you give us a little background about yourself? How did you end up here at BYU? Well, I think it was a miracle. Uh, I'm not a particularly um, scholarly person, or at least let me say, if you would have asked me as a teenager if I would be a scholar someday, a university professor, I would not have imagined that could ever happen. Um, and yet, when I look back, I can tell that I was very interested in church history and doctrine, and especially interested in learning who I am as a Latter-day Saint in every way, right? Where did I come from? What am I doing here? Where am I going? And of course, it's the restored gospel that answers those questions for me. And the academic study of the restored gospel over the years became for me as much of a religious devotion as as anything else. So the life of the mind, you know, the command to to love God with all your mind, and um, yeah, we often focus just on love God with all your heart, right? But it does say with your might, your mind. Indeed. The glory of God's intelligence or light and truth. Seek learning by study and also by faith. Uh, it's the restored gospel that gives us all these great uh, directions, doctrines about who we are. We are a mind. We are, we are souls that are destined to become like God, including knowing all the things of God, and we're commanded to get there by working really hard with both our minds and our spirits in a harmony. And so uh, that makes a lot of sense to me, and uh, uh, even though I wouldn't have recognized that in my teenage self, I can see that even then I was a seeker. I wanted to know the most important things, and I'm willing to use any means to find them out. So where did you get your Ph.D.? I went to a school in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania called Lehigh University. Uh, Lehigh spelled L-E-H-I-G-H. Yeah, we better clarify (laughs) that for Latter-day Saint listeners. Right. Uh, It was a great fit for me. Um, I actually learned that that school existed from a missionary companion of mine whose brother was on the football team there and had no idea at that point that I would ever attend school there myself, but I uh, graduated from BYU as an undergraduate in history and then did a master's degree at Utah State where my thesis investigated the, the determinants of conversion for the first generation of converts to the restored gospel. And I wanted then to go east. I wanted to study early American history. Uh, I wanted to know what went into the restoration. What was the stage Uh, What was the culture, the world, into which Joseph Smith was born? And Lehigh turned out to be a really perfect fit for me for those those reasons. What a journey. Now, I know you've also worked with the church history uh, department. Yeah, the church history department housed at the church history library in Salt Lake. Um, I worked there for six years full-time between 2012 and 2018. Were you working on the Joseph Smith Papers? I wasn't. I actually worked on the Joseph Smith Papers for the 10 years before that mm. as a volunteer volume editor. But for those six years, I was the managing historian of Saints, the four-volume history of the church that's continuing which to come out. I love, and which is making such a difference in the lives of so many members. I believe it is. Well over a million people have read it. That's amazing. How did it happen for you, Steve? I mean, you're dealing with subject material here that has taken some people away from the path, and yet you are here, and you are strong. So how did that happen in your own life? What a great uh, question. I love to tell this story. Um, I was 14 years old. I was sitting at the breakfast table. I uh, delivered my newspapers that morning. My dad had got me out of bed, as usual. Uh, let me interrupt and remind people that a newspaper is what we used to have in the olden days. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. I uh, I delivered newspapers early in the morning, and my sainted father got me out of bed to do it. And almost always, he folded the newspapers for me. 
And so give me a head start. And uh, this one morning, I'm home from my newspaper route. Dad's sitting at the table. He's already read the church news. And so now I look at it. It's probably the first time in my life I ever looked at the church news. And uh, something drew my attention to it. It had in it an article about Joseph Smith writing a letter to a fellow named Josiah Stoll. And in this letter, Joseph explains how to find how to cut the right kind of a hazel branch to turn it into a kind of magic wand to find a buried treasure. So imagine that. I'm reading that in the church news. I'm like, Dad, what is this? They, why, didn't they, why don't they teach me that at church? And he had read it. He didn't understand everything about it. He was puzzled by it. But he wasn't knocked off his feet, right? It was, I was, my head was spinning. But he was steady. And I'll never, ever forget what happened next. He said, you know, I don't understand that. I've never heard those things before, and I don't know how they fit. Then he said, I know the Book of Mormon is true. And then he told me how he knew it was true, and then he made me a promise. He said, if you will keep looking, you'll see that someday this will all work out. It'll make sense. He was exactly right. And that's why I've had the patience to keep looking ever since. Because every time I've put his, his method to the, to the test, it has worked out. It turns out that that letter was not what it was purported to be. It was a forgery. It wasn't Joseph Smith at all. And we learned that by that fall, by beginning that fall, uh, the, the forger's scheme began to unravel on him and his lies and deceit were exposed, and it became clear over time that things were not as they seemed and that there was much more to the story. I have never forgotten the lesson that, as as some neuroscientists are putting it, what you see is all there is, right? That's a, a bias that people have, including myself. It's very common for me to assume that what I see in front of my face right now is all there is to see. What my dad told me that day is, what you see is not all there is. The folks who are, who are stuck are not the, the ones who know the stuff best. Both in the early days of the church and today, those who know Joseph best believe him most. His followers who knew him best believed him most and followed him at enormous cost. And that's true today, too. The people who know the history of the church best are believers. Well, we're grateful to have you now here uh, on the Faculty of Religious Education at Brigham Young University. Thank you for all you've done. Thank you for this beautiful book. It's been published by Oxford Press, and I hope that it influences not just members of the church, but people worldwide as they come to know Joseph Smith better, and through him, come to know the Savior better. Thank you for listening to Why Religion. This podcast is a production of religious education at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. My name is Anthony Sweat. I'm the executive producer. The Why Religion podcast team also includes from Brigham Young University, professors Brad Wilcox, Casey Griffiths, and Ryan Sharp. Recording and mixing were done by BYU students Mitchell Bashford and Connor Miller. Say hi, Mitchell and Connor. Hey, guys. Hi. Original music and scoring for Why Religion podcast was created by the fabulous BYU student musicians Grant Cagle, Sam Clausen, Colette Jones, and Alistair Scheuermann. If you enjoy what you've heard, please like and subscribe to Why Religion on wherever you get your podcasts and leave us a rating. It really helps. And join us next time as we continue to bring the Everyday Latter-day Saint fascinating gospel studies done by Brigham Young University religion professors to enlighten your mind and strengthen your faith.